All right. Somebody give me a thumbs up if you can see my slides. Excellent. All right, so this month we're going to talk about the BlackBerry flow, which uh, raise your hand on Teams if you've seen a BlackBerry blossom this year. Yep, so I definitely, I'm looking outside right now and I can see uh, half a dozen blooming next to my lot too. So they're definitely coming. So this stock is just in time. All right, and so it's all about maximizing honey production at this time of year or splits. So your choice right now, you can go down one road or the other, but not both with your colonies. And that's maximizing honey production or splitting your colonies. And so today we're gonna focus on maximizing honey production. And so I'm gonna, uh, if you don't remember anything else about tonight, remember this slide, stay ahead of your nectar storage space and your brood chamber space because everyone talks about staying ahead of the storage space and the honey supers and they forget about the brood chamber space. So we'll talk more about that, but they're equally important. So what to do? What's super important is to provide need-based space for the, each colony. And as you can see, this is a tale of four different cities. They happen to be stacked next to each other, but are completely different. The two large colonies on the left have tons of bees. All those boxes are full of bees, and they had over really strong overwintered fall queens. Notice the upper entrances. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but they definitely help with creating more honey, and we'll talk about why in a minute. So the colony on the far right swarm. Yep, oops, even master beekeepers have their honeybees swarm every once in a while. In fact, my daughter that year said to me at like 7.30 in the morning, mom, why are there so many bees outside my window? And I said, I don't know, there shouldn't be that many bees. And then I went and I looked outside and I watched the swarm fly away across the neighborhood. And um, a really nice lady, where they landed about six blocks over, let me uh, collect them, but that colony did not produce any honey. And then, so, uh, who did that? Start over here. Okay, can you guys see slide three? Can you see the other slides too or just slide three? Perfect, thank you. All right, so the um, the moral of that story is make sure that you have your um, ducks in order in a row and you make sure that you keep your um, bees in just the right amount of space. And that's tricky this time of year because there's lots of bees hatching out and there's lots of bees coming and going. Now the colony that it has two deep boxes and two medium boxes on it, that's about the size you can expect for a colony um, to get to if you bought a package this year. For those of you that bought nucleus colonies, they might get a little bit bigger, might be three supers deep on the top, um, but the average size is the two supers. Those uh, two other colonies, um, produced a lot of honey, and the two on the far right hand side didn't really produce very much at all. In fact, that one that swarmed right when the blackberries started blooming didn't produce any honey at all. And notice that I've got different colored boxes. If you're artistic and have drawings and designs and stuff on your boxes, that's awesome. I'm not very artistic, about as artistic as I get is slapping a couple of different colors of paint on a roller and uh, smooshing them onto a box. But notice the different colors, um, they're purposeful. And that's because bees can see color as well. And if you've got boxes stacked together, then they drift in between the colonies. And by changing the uh, box colors, you can um, re uh, reduce the amount of drift that the bees have. 
All right, and so from now until the blackberries are done, you really ought to look inside your colonies once a week. It's about managing that brood area and it's making sure that the queen continuously has more space to lay eggs because when she runs out of space to lay eggs, that's when they think, all right, we got to get out of here and we're going to swarm. So what does that mean? So if you're running all medium boxes, you can add a box on the top, on top of the honey, but the queen will not cross that to lay eggs. So you have to add a box below the honey and on top of the, the brood area. You can also, if you have multiple colonies, you can remove a frame or two of capped brood out of the really strong colony and move it over to your weaker colony to increase the um, workflow, workforce. Because believe it or not, if you double the size of the workforce, you'll actually just about quadruple the amount of honey that you get. So it's a logarithmic scale. If you're running two deeps, um, you can replace the um, capped honey with, with the open frame. Same with the medium. You can always pull frames of capped honey out and replace those with um, drawn comb or empty comb. And then um, if you remove some brood, you can take a capped brood out. Take all the adhering nurse bees too. Just give it a light shake and the foragers will jump off. But the nurse bees hang on really tightly. And the chances of your queen being on your capped brood uh, frame is low, but not zero. So do make sure that if you're moving your capped brood frames over to another colony that you do double check to make sure your queen's not actually on there. And then sometimes people will run three deeps for a brood area. Usually those are uh, big burly men who like to lift heavy boxes and uh, don't mind the fact that the top box can get up to 100 pounds if it gets full of honey. So that's why it's not very usual that people will um, run three deeps. All right, and then a little bit more on the brood area consideration. Drone frames, that green frame in position seven over there is a really good thing to do right now because um, the queens want to be laying drones and the, um, there, if there's not a drone frame in there, they're probably building comb, ladder comb in between your boxes and filling that up with brood, uh, uh, drone brood. So by adding that drone frame in there, it helps mitigate that. And then it's a great way to help reduce the amount of mite load that you have during, um, during the season right now. And what I do, you see that there's some masking tape on the front of that box. I write the pull date. Uh, down on that uh, box. So it's a quick reminder that I need to pull the drone frame out before the um, drones start hatching out. So you want to get that sweet spot when they're almost all capped, but not quite all hatching out yet. If a few drones hatch, no big deal, but it's bad if um, you have a lot of mites in those cells and you forget for a week and that all hatch out, you've just given yourself a mite bomb. So if you use drone frames, you do have to keep on top of it. And then um, you know, looking for swarm cells. Uh, if you in a minute, we'll I'll show another picture, but make sure that um, you know by leaving extra space in the colony that um, they're not putting eggs in these swarm cells. Um, this time of year, I they always occur in between my two deep boxes, and I just nick those off every week. There's not any queens uh, that have laid eggs in them usually. Um, so I just nick those off so that I can keep track of whether they've built more the following week. So one quick way right now to, um, I don't usually look in the bottom boxes this time of year. There's really no need because the queen is laying in the, in both boxes. So I really just tip the top box um, up a little bit so that I can look underneath there and see if there's any swarm cells. If there are any swarm cells, I can just pull those frames out. And usually those are the capped ones anyway. And then I typically move those to another box. Um, but I've got lots of boxes to, you know, move them in between. If you've only got one or two, then what you need to do is add more space. Um, so you can always add an extra medium uh, as a brood area change. Uh, spot if you don't want to use three uh, three deeps like most people don't um, but again that 
extra box needs to be placed in between where they're storing honey and where that brood chamber is. So by tipping it up each week, you can see if they're building any swarm cells out. All right, and then should I feed sugar syrup or not? This is a hot debate, right? So the answer is definitely no. If you have your supers on and you're going to sell your honey, it might be yes if you're new to beekeeping and your bees don't have any um, comb built in your honey supers yet. So if you stop, they're going to slow down on the wax production. Now, as blackberries get going over the next couple of weeks, they're going to have plenty of nectar to build that wax with, but it still takes a lot of energy to do that. So if you're not selling your honey and you don't have any comb in your supers, it's really okay to go ahead and feed for a little while until they start getting that wax built out. And remember, there, there will be people on the um, Facebook and different groups that will tell you absolutely yes or absolutely no. And what, what I tell people is just remember they're your bees and it's your decision. And so long as you're not selling your honey, um, then you can really make a choice on whether you want to feed for a little while during the honey flow or not. And then a word on queen excluders. Some people love them, some people hate them. I personally love them because I don't like to have the queens lay eggs in my honey supers. And the, one of the reasons I don't like that is because it also um, encourages wax moths to get in there over the winter before it freezes and they ruin your comb. The other reason is that the more brood that gets laid in your honey supers, the more, uh, the darker your honey will get because the color leaches out of the comb a little bit. So if you want super light blackberry honey, it's a good idea to keep your queen from laying in your supers ever. And that way your wax stays nice and light and your honey stays nice and light. So if you're gonna use a queen excluder though, you need to make sure that you're managing that brood area. If you're not managing the brood area and you um, wanna have a little easier time of it, just put some supers on without the queen excluder and let her lay as far up into your supers as, um, as she wants to. Now, there are two different kind of queen excluders. One where the, where the openings open parallel with the frames. And that's what I have on there in the left-hand uh, picture. And that's uh, pretty easy for the bees to make it up through the holes. But um, the one on the right-hand side has the, um, has the slats opening perpendicular to the frames. And those are very hard for the bees to get through. And those are often what people talk about as honey excluders as opposed to a queen excluder. Also because they don't use upper entrances. So that's on the next slide. Notice how the next slide shows that all the bees are on the outside of the box um, close to those upper entrances. So I have a upper entrance right on top of my, um, I'll go back one slide, right on top of my um, queen excluder. And these are called emery shims or eats. You can make them really easily or buy them at the bee supply places. They're basically just a shim with an opening in the front. And so the bees can get in and out of there. The other reason to use those is that if you think about rush hour traffic and how many times you can get to Seattle in an hour from, say, Tugwella, you can you can get there and back about four times at midnight. But in the morning at seven o'clock, you might get there once, but certainly not back to Tugwella. So if you think about rush hour traffic and bees trying to bring um, honey back, it's the same sort of concept. So if you can free up their ability to travel back and forth to where the nectar is, and they can make four trips in an hour instead of only one trip, doesn't take a math wizard to figure out that you're gonna get more honey from that. So that's why I have on that left-hand box, you see that I have those two deep boxes and then that first opening where all those bees are. And then I have two supers and then another Emory shim and then two supers. And then on the very top is where my, um, 
where my inner cover goes and those are notched as well. So that colony has the lower entrance. They have the entrance right above the um, brood box and then two in the honey supers. So they've actually got four entrances to come and go from. And as you see, they really do like to use those upper entrances because it's not as congested. All right, and then another way to keep the bees, uh, to, to help keep the bees from swarming, nothing's that absolute in beekeeping, is um, something called checkerboarding. And you can, uh, what, you, what you do is because that wet nectar takes up a lot more room than dried out honey, you need to have extra space for them to store that while it's dehydrating. Plus bees like a really orderly living space. And they do not like the fact that um, you've now checkerboarded or put honey, and in this box it's a honey and a new frame, honey, a new frame, et cetera. And then if you think about this like a checkerboard, in the box below, it's just the opposite. So it's a new frame and then a honey frame, a new frame and a honey frame. And so what they'll do is they'll get obsessed with fixing that space and making it all nice and orderly before they want to swarm. And so that really helps slow down the swarm urge. You'll see in the Facebook posts that sometimes people say, oh yeah, checkerboard your brood box. And that's a really bad idea because you don't want to split up your brood. What you can do, and that's what I advocated for taking out a frame or two of capped brood, it's okay to take a frame of capped brood out at say position three and maybe one at position seven too and put um, a comb in there so the queen can lay there but you don't want to absolutely checkerboard it all the way across because um, that will actually help induce a swarm because they think that um, the brood ball uh, separated and they get confused and they're like, this place is not to our liking. So they're, they're more likely to leave. So checkerboarding your, your honey storage area works and not so much your brood area. Oh, we'll get this thing to go. There we go. So later on in the summer, when it gets a little bit warmer and there gets to be more and more bee population, the bees will tend to beard on the outside, especially at night. There's a lot of bees in there. And the, during the daytime, they don't do it so much because the foragers are all out in the field and there's not as high a population. Uh, but when everybody comes home from work at, uh, in the evening, there's too many bees and it can get too, actually too hot inside the colony. So the foragers will move outside so that the, um, the uh, nurse bees can have more space to tend the brood and the, they don't contribute to heating up the internal hive temperature. So they do have to keep that temperature at around 95. And you can imagine on a hot summer afternoon, with all those bees coming back and all those hot bodies in there that it actually makes it too hot. And so bees will beard on the bottom. So some ways to um, mitigate that is by using those upper entrances because hot air rises, right? And shoots right out through those holes. So that helps. It, those upper entrances also help with the airflow. And if you think about a hairdryer, it's the same concept in the beehive with your honey too. You've got that hot air blowing through the hive and circulating, you know, you know, through the colony and up and out those holes, it helps to dry out the honey faster. Um, so um, a couple other things that help is to, you know, add space. Um, in the summer, so what if you have an extra honey super on the top more than what they need that um, they can expand into, it's extra space for the bees to go to. There's also something called a a slatted rack, and that's the picture there. Um, I read about the slatted racks on Rusty Burlew's Honeybee Suite a bunch of years ago, um, and they um, really work well to reduce the amount of bearding that goes on. I'll go back a couple of slides and show you something that some of you may have noticed. My slide will catch up to me. Notice the colony on the right hand side, how I have a medium box on the very bottom. That colony was bearding terribly and I didn't have any slatted racks and Kathy Cox is super smart. And I said, Kathy, I can't get these beers, bees to stop bearding. And she's like, well, you got lots of medium boxes. Why don't you just put an empty medium box on the bottom? Maybe they'll draw some comb, maybe they won't. 
but it'll be a great place for the extra bees to hang out instead of hanging out on the outside. So I took the whole darn thing apart the next time and put that on there and they never bearded again for that season. So it really worked. All right, so we're just gonna end and then we'll, uh, we've got a little bit of time for questions. Um, reminding everybody what I said and at the beginning is space management in during the honey flow, during blackberry season is about maximizing the size of your workforce and staying ahead of the nectar stored space plus that brood laying space. So people always think that it's all about having more room for the honey uh, storage. It's not, it's equally important to make sure that the Queen ha always has a place to lay more eggs. And then finally, I'm going to end on a sneak peek, sneak peek for July. Um, if you don't have robbing screens yet, now's the time to order them. And I heard that medium boxes are sold out in a couple of the uh, beekeeping sites. Uh, so this is one thing that you're gonna wanna have if you don't have one. June uh, is fine, July and August are when the yellow jackets start getting nasty. And um, all those bees actually in the front of this colony aren't bees at all, they're wasps. And this is a colony at my um, out yard in the Renton Highlands. And while I was uh, not there over the course of a week, the uh, wasps got in there and killed them all before I could get the front entrance closed on this, um, on this, uh, Robbing screen. So order those now, or they're easy to make too if you're handy in the shop. Um, just make sure that you get them on before the blackberries. Uh, well, you don't want them on during the blackberries. You want them on though before the yellow jackets get nasty. And I'm just afraid that this year is going to be like last year, and you're not going to actually be able to order them when you need. So with that, I will end, turn this presentation off, and see if anybody has any questions for a couple minutes. We actually do have a bunch of questions. Uh, the first question that came in was um, whether there was a difference in how you set up your brood area for eight frame setups. Um, no, you just need more boxes. So eight frame setups are great. You can run eight frame setups a couple times, a couple different ways. You can use ten frame boxes, and you can use follower boards on the outside and make that an eight frame box. Or if you use True A-frame boxes, you just have to stack more boxes on. And I see someone's run a two queen colony like that uh, in the chat. I've done that too, it's kind of fun. And they make a lot of honey. Nice, thank you. Um, the second question uh, came in from Bill and it is, uh, where is it that you put the drone frames when you want to use drone frames for vera control? Do you put them in the supers? Do you put them in the in the so brood box? They go in the top brood box and you can put them anywhere, but I found that the place that they seem to work the best is either in position three or seven. Some places say put them in position two or eight, but a lot of times my queen ignores them if I put them there, except you know during July. Um, so if you put them in in spot three or spot seven right now in the top box that's the most convenient for you to get to and so that's why i put them in the top um brood box thank you um after that it was about wasps uh when you have multiple entrances in your in your hive does that cause a problem with predatory wasps um it's that's a good question so it's interesting as the you know after the honey flow then the bees start reducing their population too. So as I'm removing those boxes, so go the extra entrances. And I've seen the bees up there like stack 10 high and as the wasp comes in, they all move as one and they follow the wasp. So they don't tend to get into the upper entrances, it's that lower entrance that isn't guarded as well that they tend to get into. And so when the wasps come out, we'll talk about this later in the summer, but when the wasps come out, and your bee population is going down, that's when you just go ahead and close that front entrance on the on the robbing screen because the wasps aren't smart enough to figure out that they have to land on the box and then go down through the upper hole. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, yeah. We have 
got a few questions coming in. Um, the next one that came over was um, that you talk about never splitting the brood uh, when you checkerboard. And could you explain why? Yeah, because the bees um, don't like that and they tend to swarm. That's the short answer. The long answer is it's okay, like I said, to pull out a couple frames of capped brood and either push you know, the brood all in and put more frames on the outside. Or if you've got brood all the way to the outside, like happens this time of year, just go ahead and pull you know, space three out and put one frame in. That's one or two frames in a box is no problem. It's when you checkerboard them all that the, that the bees don't like that. I have some questions, but it says that the administrator has disabled the chat for me. Oh, sorry about that. How about you ask a question then? Go ahead. Okay, well, we just got two nukes last month and both of them swarmed already. So we managed to get one of the swarms back and we put it into a nuke box. So what do we do now? <laughs> That's a really good question. So it, my question back to you is how many colonies do you want? Two. Two, okay, so if you wanna maintain two, then what you need to do is as soon as the qu new queen is laying eggs in that box that they swarmed out of, um, then what you need to do is choose which queen you wanna kill and then you do something called a newspaper combine. And we don't have time to talk about that tonight, but it's easily Googled. Um, do a newspaper combine with only one queen and then um, just uh, go ahead and recombine them. If you can't find the queen or can't find it in your heart to kill one of them, if you do a newspaper combine with one queen on top, one queen on bottom, um, your colony will end up with one queen and it's usually the queen on the bottom. And they'll take care of it for you. Why don't we take one more question for now and then I'm sure Kit has some club business in the main speaker. Well, the next question actually was from Kit, which was, could you talk a little bit about the two queens that you were talking about? Having two, two queen colony. So I don't know who put the two queen colony in the chat. My, it's, my, it's not rolling. So if you click on the chat bar, someone posted a picture with um, two queens. Can you guys see that? So there's two boxes right next to each other with uh, the super centered over the middle. Is that from last month's chat? That might be. So if you have two colonies sitting side by side and the super sitting in the middle on the top, um, you have to have two queen excluders. And then so the queens can't get to each other, but the workforce, um, the the Nurse bees work in their separate boxes and the foragers um, put honey up in those supers. And so you have extra workforce and those two queens laying lots of eggs. So you get a lot of bees. And so remember I said earlier, you have, uh, if you double the workforce, you can quadruple your honey just about. And that's what happens in those two queen colonies. You do have to have two um, half lids though, because, uh, and then for here with our weather, I also use duct tape on the, uh, in the middle where the, you know, where the supers are and you've got those half boxes. I just ran a seam of duct tape on there because the water was running down in there. I didn't do that. Because it never rains in June here, right? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Um, you know, um, actually, you could, you can speak for another five minutes. I know I don't have a full 30 minutes. Ray's already with us. Hi, Ray. And we can, um, we'll still get to her without um, keeping her waiting. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's so many questions. I think this is very valuable. We can bring this, come back to questions after we're done with Ray's questions too, but this kind we of- Yeah, I have to pick up some bees at 8.30, so I'll, I'll call back in on my phone. Okay, well, that's okay. If we do it now, then we won't have to worry. Go, go. I think you can go for 10 more minutes. Okay. If there's that much time to use. All right, then uh, some of the questions are going to be quick. Uh, the next one was uh, one of the participants was advised to use nine frames in a 10 frame box so that the bees would have more room to draw calm, but that 
led to a lot of wild calm being drawn. And so <laughs> yes, uh, it does. They're wondering if there is any reason at any point that you would use nine frames in a 10 frame box. So I use nine frames in my honey super boxes and I start with 10 though. And the reason why is you can make them, uh, if you start with 10, then they draw the comb out to the edges of the frames and they don't make crazy comb. Once you have 10 frames like that, you can pull one out and then spread them out evenly. You can get a spacer for that or just kind of, you know, space them out. And then what they'll do is they'll draw the wax out beyond the edges of the super frames. And those are easier to cut the cappings off of when you extract and they make them really fat and heavy. So you can actually get more honey um, that way. So that's what people were talking about, about using nine frames in a box. It's in the honey super box. And it's only after you they've drawn out all 10 frames. Thank you. Yeah. Next question is, when do you recommend combining double queened colonies for this year? Uh, so double queen colonies, uh, it depends. Uh, I would lean towards leaving them separate colonies. So just when you're done pulling your supers off, you just put lids on the top and then you've got two colonies that you go into the winter with and hope to get one out. So it's better if you've got two full-size colonies, go ahead and leave them two full-size colonies, and then that doubles your chances of getting one through the winter. <laughs> Thanks. There's the next one that should be relatively uh, fast, which is how often do you swap out the drone frames? It depends. <laughs> so you have to watch them to see when they get capped. So... Um, it takes 24 days for the drones to hatch, right? So I mark mine for 21 days, but it takes a little bit of time for them to draw the wax out first. So if you're starting from zero, put 21 days on there, especially when the honey flow is going, because they might draw the wax out really fast. At 21 days, you can look at it and say, okay, another week. But if you look in 28 days and half of them are hatched, you're like, oh, so 21 days and then another week, you know, just kind of gauge it from there to see. And then I just take one out and I put one right back in. And then um, towards the end of the summer, like end of July, they won't make any more drones usually or very few. And they usually won't fill it up anyway. And if they if it's on that, you know, position seven, sometimes they start filling it up with honey. And if they do that, I just move it out to position 10 and let them use it for the winter. Thanks. Yep. Um, we have a person who wants to remove capped honey frames from the brood boxes and is wondering if uh, it's necessary to freeze them first or they're worried about wax moths. Is there anything yeah. special we should do? It's not a bad idea. Um, since we don't have small hive beetles here, that's not an issue, but it's not a bad idea to freeze them. Um, freezing, you would think, would make capped honey crystallize, but it doesn't. So if you have the ability to freeze that uh, for a couple of days and then store it, um, you can definitely do that. I know um, Kathy pulls hers out one frame at a time. And for those of you that can't lift a lot, that's another really good way to manage your space is to just pull one frame at a time and take a you know a few frames into the house um, instead of a whole box. And um, if you've got your own extractor, you can even um, you know spin those out right away and and put them right back in. Thank you. Um, I'm going to actually ask Adam's question and Rita, I am trying to understand exactly what you're describing. It might be better if you unmute yourself after I ask Adam's question, uh, if you don't mind. Um, and um, Adam uh, has had an issue where uh, he added on a second brood box before the bees uh, built uh, everything in the lower frames of the bottom box. And so they started drawing wax on the top box and now the frames are not drawn on that lower box. And he's wondering uh, if he can move the frames around and he can do to try to help the bees. Yep, out. Adam, you can always move your frames around. And the bees have a really hard time of building wax on the outside in between the brood box and the last frame. 
So you can rotate that in a couple frames or you can pick it up and flip it around and put it in so the drawn combs on the outside. Um, if there's some B blog somewhere that says draw a line on your frames and that way you always know where they go back in the same order and that's hocus pocus. You, you can move them around all you want. It's best to keep the brood together, right? So keep the brood together as much as you can, except for one or two frames here and there. Um, but that position three and four are really good spots to get wax drawn out really fast. So if you want to move it in there and then move it back out, so long as the queen hasn't laid eggs on it yet, you can do that. You can move it in one and flop it, you know, there's lots of things you can do. Um, so long as you're not totally checkerboarding the whole box, feel free to move them around. Especially, you know, right now, because it's warm. Um, Early when it was really cold out, you wouldn't want to take a frame that had eggs on it, let's say, and put it on the outside and move another one in because then that would get chilled and they that probably they would probably wouldn't hatch. But right now it's warm enough, it's really forgiving. You can get away with it. Thank you. Rita, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Because I think you, you really need to describe what it is that's happened. <laughs> yes. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think I made it more or sound more complicated than it actually is. So I think, you know, when I got my beekeeping supplies, I'm a first time beekeeper this year. So like everything is new to me. <laughs> but um, I got a frame feeder and I was really unclear about whether or not. So like I stored, so I had my my beef box on the bottom where I put my nuke in with the extra frames and everything so it's you know 10 frames in there um and then I added a second box on top that was where the frame feeder was sitting but it was unclear to me if I was supposed to put the empty frames in there with it or just leave the box empty I guess and so I left oh. it empty and my bees just kind of drew a bunch of crazy comb upwards so that's they yeah did, didn't that's, they? <laughs> yes, they did <laughs> So you're asking what to do with the extra comb or to add, what, what's the question? Oh, just to, I just, I'm wondering if I should have given them frames, I suppose, yeah. in those boxes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I just wanted to yeah. check. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I hate saying always, but I'm going to do it anyway. Always fill your boxes with frames, right? And so if you have a frame feeder, people put that on the outside next to the wood box. And then you put, you know, all the rest frames. And if you happen to save that comb, you could always rubber band it into um, into comb or into frames that don't have foundation. Um, there's actually a chat on women in beekeeping right now that um, has that or Western Washington beekeepers has it too. So um, it's easy to do if you, if you save that comb. It, be careful though, because that comb is oftentimes drone comb and you don't necessarily want to keep that. Great, thank you so much for clarifying. Yeah. And it's okay if you have your frame feeder in the bottom box, it's just a pain to refill it. So no, nothing says you have to have it in the top box. It's just a whole lot easier if you do. <clears throat> thank you, I have one last question from, I think it's probably pronounced Katie. Uh, feel free to actually unmute yourself because I, um, I'm just wondering if like your first year beekeeper, if you've ordered and not recommend received your bees yet or what the exact situation is. So yeah, I'm a first year beekeeper. I haven't gotten my nukes yet, but hopefully we'll get them soon. And I just wondered any, like for those of us that are starting this far into the season, is there anything we should do differently? I know we should feed, but anything other than that? Yeah. If you're getting a nuke this late, it's not late at all for getting a nuke. And uh, in fact, I've got several more to go out over the next uh, week or so myself. And so the thing with blackberries is that the population explodes. And I think that the experience that people have that are new and they get nucleus colonies is just how fast they build up, especially if you get a really strong nuke that has capped brood. You can have a real explosion in your population before you know it. So. A general rule of thumb for everybody is you start in either two mediums or one deep. Oftentimes, uh, nukes come in deep, so I'll just talk about that. So you start with your five-frame nuke in a 10-frame box. Once the bees are, have eight of those frames drawn out and are covering it, then that's when you add the next box. And so 
they do that a lot faster right now than they did a month, month and a half ago. And so it's not a bad idea to look every week. And when you pull your, um, when you pull your frames out of your nuke, look on the bottom for the swarm cells because they don't have to stay in those swarm bo or those nuke boxes for very long before they outgrow them. And they may be thinking it's time to swarm. And so if you don't catch those swarm cells on the bottom and cut them off, um, then you might end up where your nukes swarm in you know, a month or so. So you don't want that. Just um, keep adding more space once the bees get you know, that 70 to 80% of the comb drawn out of box. New beekeepers tend to make the mistake of adding boxes too soon. Um, humans, we've gotten used to social distancing, especially this year, and bees don't work well socially distanced. So they like to be crowded and they draw wax a lot better if they're all together, um, festooning and clumped together. So um, it's important to keep them close, but not too close. Kelly, I see your hands up. Um, hi, um, we have two um, hives, and believe it or not, within the next two weeks, both have swarmed. We have been watching to see if they have new brood, to see if they're trying to do something, and so far, neither boxes have a brood or a queen, or a queen that we can find. Um, yeah. I two resumed. I, you want but to we talk? Have, we have two super seeder cells in one. A uh, one box colony, um, and then in a, our two box we have no queen, no brood, nothing, um, and we've reserved a queen. Is that and we're going to pick up a queen Thursday? Is that what we should do? Is requeen that colony? Or we should wait and see what they do. <laughs> so if they truly did swarm, then you probably have a virgin queen in there. So if they swarm and they've got a capped queen already, did. Did they? Do you know if they had a capped queen before they swarmed? Um, I think they did. Yes. Okay. So the capped queen will take another week, week and a half to hatch, and then another week, week and a half to start laying. Oh so, well, no. When we we inspected our hives Sunday, and there was no, um, there was no queen cells or anything in the two right, box they'll, colony. They'll nothing. tear those down in really the, fast. Actually. The first colony looked good with those, but not the second. Second didn't have any type of queen cells. Right, so it's probable if, if they did swarm, they had a queen cell and they just, they recycle the wax. So okay. they tear those cells down pretty fast. So okay. it's, it's likely that you have a virgin queen in there. And I'd wait another week before I bought another queen. Okay, and thank you. for eggs. Okay. And then one with super seeder cells, they've decided, so super seeder cells, for those of you who don't know, are queen cells that are emergency queens that are somewhere randomly placed in the, you know, on the face of the comb. And so that is telling you that for whatever reason, they don't like that queen. Either she's damaged, she's running out of sperm, it was a spring queen, she didn't get very well mated, that happens a lot. And they're like, we don't like her and we're getting a new one. And so what people make the mistake of is cutting out those super seeder cells and then they find themselves uh, queenless exactly. and it, then they end up hopelessly queenless and then they end up with laying workers and they try to fix it. And that is really almost not fixable. Okay, so, well, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Do we have time for a couple more questions? We have some hand raised and one that just got posted, but I'm assuming we're we're getting there where <laughs> you have to stop it, right? For now. We should probably um, get back on track because I think questions can be endless. I see um, one question. I just want to uh, introduce myself. I'm Kit Hyatt and I'm president of Puget Sound Beekeepers. And thank you, Tracy, for all that wonderful information. I always learn so much listening to you. Um, I don't care when or how. There's always yeah, my pleasure. I, I wish I had a pen to write down too. I think I'll make listen twice. Um, so uh, the question that Bill has about what how many drone frames you use in your colony and um, that's one of my favorite things is rotating drone comb in and out and 
so I, I, I don't think there's a right answer for that, though. You get to use as much or as little as you feel needed by your bees. Um, some queens seem to draw to uh, lay a lot more drone than others. And also you might suspect you have an issue with mites and you would like to see a drone comb um, frame in every super, I mean, in every um, brood box. Um, so um, yeah, so um, to introduce PSBA, we, as most of you know, um, we are a 5013C a corporation and um, we're a nonprofit charity, which means that we are entirely volunteer run. There are no paid staff involved with PSBA. Everything that you see happening before you and everything that you um, know of in the background is being done by people who are offering their time to make it all possible. So um, if there's those among you who are open to getting involved, and finding out what roles you might be best um, placed within the organization. You know, it it takes a little bit of feeling out to find your place, but um, there's lots of opportunity and we really welcome um, your involvement and reach out to any board member, um, you know, just reply to the president's message. You can send me a note and we can talk and um, it's it's been challenging the last year to involve new volunteers because there haven't been events and we're not interfacing with each other. On the other hand, um, there has been a lot going on. So um, there are 12 board members currently and we've been busy with different things like putting to pulling together the begin, beginning beekeeper classes, which were a fabulous success. Um, you know, of course, we've never done those virtually before, and um, uh, I think we're really proud of how they came together and were executed. They took a huge amount of man hours and um, woman hours, too, and we, um, you know, there's there's great energy behind PSBA, but we can always use more. Um, and um, the, uh, let's see, there was another thought. Um, I am, we're working hard at, to figure out what is, what the summer will look like. I know everyone's curious and has different points of comfort, but, um, effective today, um, we have put a hold on space at Center for Urban Horticulture for the June meeting on the 25th, um, to have it outside in that lovely courtyard. Uh, we will also have access to our meeting room there at CUH um, so that we can, you know, fewer people are allowed if we end up in the meeting room, if the weather is inclement, then we can have outside. But in any case, there are restrictions that the University of Washington is asking of us in order to have a group event. And um, so that will be included with all the information about the meeting, but I'm excited to be able to see people and have the community that I feel is really pivotal to what makes PSBA um, a great thing. You know, talking bees with people in person is really fun. Although, you know, this team thing has turned into something special too. I think there's going to have to be a role for it somehow in, in uh, at some times. Um, and I'm open uh, if you want to, um, uh, I'm really interested in feedback from members. It's really hard in these days of not seeing you guys um, and having that opportunity for people to kind of crowd around and express how they're feeling to uh, hear what you're thinking. And if you want it, um, please type into the chat that um, any feelings that you have about um, what it is that you hope to see happen this summer, whether you really prefer the online because you live in, you know, Bellingham. I don't know that you would do that. You'd be with a different group if that was the case, but, um, or um, something of that sort. I'm also really interested to ask you, please, to express what it is that you 
most want to personally get from your membership with Puget Sound Beekeepers Association, um, that is a really good thing to know, right? Because then we can know that our mission is in align with your mission. If what we're providing you meets your wishes, then we're doing our job. And it can be that as times change, you know, wishes shift too. So uh, really open to knowing uh, maybe tonight in the chat, or maybe you'd like to just send me an email at khyatt, that's H-I-A-T-T -T at PugetSoundBees.org um, to just start a dialogue because that input is really valuable. Um, so yeah, the goal is to just have a wonderful beekeeping community and to help each other learn and to um, be able to talk bees. You know, my husband can only take so much. So um, that is what makes PSBA rock. Um, so with that, I think I'd love to, in, to introduce Ray, um, who is a PhD at Washington State University. Uh, which is a um, wonderful entomology program that uh, Puget Sound Beekeepers Association has supported for a number of years. Uh, they support us a lot too, so it's a um, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful thing to have WSU in our backyard. Uh, Ray, I I um, I know that your um, your presentation is. Has is multifaceted and um, and I and I find your background very interesting too. I I would love it if you would introduce so that you can express. I think that would be best. You you know best. So with that, I'm going to turn turn the 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 mic over and thank you very much, Ray. Thanks, Kit, um, and thank you all so much for having me here today. Um, I as Kit mentioned, I am a. Um, PhD working at Washington State University, um, and I'll talk a little bit about my background. You said that you really want to have all of your meetings in person, and there's no way that someone from like Bellingham would join because they'd be part of a different group, but I've already learned so much from this <laughs> that I want to be a member even though I'm over here in Pullman. <laughs> um, so I... Um, yeah, so I have been living in Pullman for six years, but I grew up in Olympia. Um, I didn't actually start beekeeping or working with honeybees until about a year ago. Um, prior to that, the majority of my research and my interest was in wild pollinators, and that's going to be the focus, the main focus of my talk tonight is supporting a diverse community of pollinators, which I think everything that you can do to support a diverse pollinator community will also help your honeybees. Um, and, and yeah, I, uh, but the majority of the beekeeping work that I do is focused on the commercial side of beekeeping, whether it's working directly with commercial beekeepers or WSU has kind of a smallish commercial operation that we largely use for research and teaching, but we do produce a fair amount of honey that we sell, um, locally. And, and so the majority of my experience is, you know, working on a scale of, you know, one to 200 or more colonies. And so it is really interesting to learn a little bit from you all about some of the nuance that you can get into when you only have a couple, um, a couple of hives. And I just have one hive at my house. So, um, so I, I, I do think that's really interesting. And I'm, I'm excited to um, explore some of the several pages of notes that I've already taken. Um, okay, I apologize if you can hear little shuffling, rustling noises in the background. Um, I have pet quail that just sit right here next to me. Um, I don't know if you can even, you might be able to see them, but they make little beeping noises that sort of sound like R2-D2. Um, hopefully it's not too distracting. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, oh, looks like I have to. I don't know if I've ever done any screen sharing in Teams before. I always use Zoom. Um, so let me just really quick allow. I think it, it wants me to allow the recording. Um, so, okay, there we go. Oh, it looks like I have to quit and reopen. So I'll be right back.
while she's reconnecting, uh, I want to thank everybody who's been putting some thoughts in the chat. Please, please uh, don't hesitate to give us, as Kit was saying, some thoughts about what you'd like to do, uh, what you'd like to see happen, whether you want those meetings to stay online or in person, anything that you would like to comment on that or your expectations, uh, they will really help us uh, figure out what to do next and how to help you best. The exciting thing is that our next meeting is the day after the solstice, so we'll be able to be outside and not um, be hopefully it could be a really comfortable evening. And so that that seems kind of exciting. But what we do after that, let's yeah, totally it's, it's so mad. Can you hear me? Now we can, can hear you. Can, can, can you I see can, my screen? I can see it. It's not in presenter mode at the moment. Okay. But just I wanted to I make sure. OK. Should be heading into print presenter mode now. There we go. OK. Um, again, thank you for your patience. Like I said, I'm so used to using Zoom. I hadn't had my computer give me all of or give, given all my computer the permissions. Um, so thank you again for um, inviting me. Um, I have the captioning on that is available through PowerPoint. Hopefully um, it's not always perfect, but I do really appreciate the accessibility that this tool offers. So um, if you know it captions thing a little bit weird because PowerPoint doesn't understand certain like pollinator terms, um, I do apologize and definitely you know, add uh, questions or clarifying um, questions in the chat. So today I'll largely be talking about wild pollinators and how to support a diverse community of pollinators. Um, just a little bit of my background. I graduated from the Evergreen State College in Olympia in 2014 with a dual BABS um, focused primarily in um, sustainable agriculture and um, community food systems development. Um, after that, I started at WSU in the entomology department in January of 2015. And the research that I did during my PhD um, was split between the Puget Sound area and then Eastern Washington. Um, so I'll, I'll be able to talk a little bit about both of those things. Um, before I went to college, I had a ton of different types of jobs. Um, and all of that kind of informed my real interest in the world, which I kind of found um, to really fall into entomology. Um, I've been working in the WSU B lab for the past year as a postdoc. Um, since last May, it's actually just, just past my one year anniversary as a postdoc in the Honey Bee Lab. Um, and I've really enjoyed the work and I've really enjoyed learning and getting to know more about the Honey Bee system um, here. and. Um, and I'm really focused on improving the tools available for beekeepers, which I will talk about at the end. So for me, I was I've always been really interested in kind of the world and how everything works together and how humans are connected to the world that we live in. Um, you can see here, these are just kind of a little mind map of some of the things that I'm interested in. And pretty much every aspect of life can be connected through insects and arthropods. Um, insects are the most diverse organism on the planet. They're the most um, speciose and also the most abundant organism on the planet, I think, except for maybe bacteria. Um, and insects occupy every different level of the food web. They occupy every different sort of um, niche in terms of, you know, we have insects that consume um, detritus, we have herbivores, predators, parasites, you know, kind of all of the different levels. Insects interact with humans directly, 
They interact with the plants that we eat. They interact with our water and our air and the soil. And, and so I was really fascinated by, you know, these generally very small creatures that shape so much of the world around us. Um, a few things, hopefully, because you are all at least interested, if not um, probably far uh, beyond me in terms of expertise when we're talking about bees, um, but just a couple things to know, kind of keep forward in your brain. Um, insects are responsible for pollinating about 70% pollinating about of global food crops that are consumed by humans. Um, it's pretty well known that overall pollinators have been declining for the last several decades due to a number of different things. Um, the primary reasons for those declines are reduced habitat, increased exposure to pesticides, increased rates of disease, and loss of floral resources. Um, the majority of insects that pollinate human food, crop, food crops are bees, but they are not the only insects that pollinate food crops. Um, and then, of course, pollination, kind of throwing back to some high school biology, pollination occurs when the pollen or sperm cell of a plant is transferred to the ovary of another plant, leading to fruiting and reproduction. Um, and finally, insects support pollination by collecting pollens, uh, pollen grains from plants and transporting it to other plants in this pollination process. Um, other methods of pollination include wind pollination, um, bird-mediated pollination, bat, moth, um, human-mediated <laughs> pollination. So there's a lot of different types of, of pollination, but insects support that pollination pretty significantly across the world. Okay, so first we're going to talk about just some of the different pollinators um, that you might be familiar with. Um, hopefully you can all recognize that this is not a bee. Um, this is a surfid fly or a hoverfly. They're great predators when they're juveniles. They eat lots of things like aphids and stuff that we don't want in our gardens. Um, but actually up until about three years ago, the WSU Health Center had a picture of one of these flies on their bee and wasp sting allergy brochure. Um, the Entomology Grad Student Association uh, did a little educational series for them on um, how to identify the difference between a fly and a bee. So we're going to talk a little bit about those pollinator declines, and then we'll go into some of the different um, some of the different types of bees and other pollinating insects. And you'll see I use a lot of images from Megan Ash. Megan, you may you some of you might be familiar with her. She um, is just finishing up her PhD here at WSU. She did her master's degree in our bee program, and I'm pretty sure she's been a speaker for you all in the past. Um, so Megan is also from the Puget Sound region. She and I actually went to high school together. So pollinator declines are largely attributed to the four Ps, uh, parasites, pathogens, pesticides, and poor nutrition. Those four Ps kind of make up the bulk of why we see pollinator declines. And in large part, it's not just like one individual piece of the um, piece of that puzzle, but multiple uh, multiple aspects of those four Ps kind of interacting with each other to create really dramatic problems. Parasites and predators, these are things that you're, I'm sure, aware of, familiar with. Um, we've already talked about mites and wasps um, and beetles, actually, in um, just in, earlier in this meeting. Um, there's also types of kleptoparasitic bees, which um, I don't think that honeybees have a kleptoparasite in this area, but um, it is relatively common in other types of bees where there's a bee that has a pretty close, um, they're pretty, pretty closely related um, to another, for example, a bumblebee. Um, the, uh, the kleptoparasitic bee will lay her eggs in the nest of a bumblebee um, and then the parasitic bee larvae hatch out earlier and consume the food stores um, that the bumblebees would have fed on. So similar to like a cuckoo bird, um, and, in, and in fact, these are also called cuckoo bees. Pathogens are another really big problem. Um, I know we have, we do a lot of um, 
we see a lot of Nosema coming in here from some of the commercial beekeepers. Um, pathogens of various types can be spread in the nest for these colony nesting bees like honeybees and bumblebees. They can be spread through sexual contact or they can be spread through contact with a dirty surface. Um, kind of if you think about a flower um, has sort of a similar effect as like a dirty doorknob for humans. Um, some of these pathogens can be left on a flower and then picked up by the next bee that comes into contact with it. Pesticides are something that hopefully you all don't have to deal too much with. I had a pesticide kill on my hive earlier this year. It was pretty heartbreaking. Um, and the majority of pesticide harm to bees comes from improper use. Um, improper application, folks not reading the labels, not applying their pesticides at the correct time of day, or mixing different um, ingredients together um, that cause an interaction that was unexpected. Um, there's also the majority of pesticide studies done on bees are looking at the sort of immediate exposure and they're looking at what it takes to kill 50% of the population. That's what that LD50 is. If you ever um, read a pesticide label, LD50 is something that um, you'll see and that is um, a regular, it's, um, it's the limit of the dose that needs to be applied to kill half the population. Um, but the studies are not typically done in looking at how like lower rate long-term exposure affects the bees. Um, and, and lab exposure rates versus field exposure rates are quite different. And so some of the work that my lab is doing now is looking at how pesticide residues accumulate in the hive of honeybees and how that long-term low-grade exposure could be affecting colony health. Poor nutrition is another one of those big issues. Um, floral resource loss due to development and deforestation or um, agriculture, as is a really huge issue here on this side of the state, um, where we used to have thousands and thousands of acres of prairies full of wildflower. Most of that has now been converted to wheat. Um, and while I really appreciate being surrounded by wheat and the crops and everything that we have growing here, because I'm happy to have a nice close food resource for myself, um, that does really limit the food resources available for bees because the majority of the crops that are being grown uh, are not insect pollinated and don't provide any sort of floral nectar or pollen resources for the bees. The other issues um, include things like parking lots, um, you know, paving over areas that would have provided um, floral resources and, and using it for, you know, parking or malls or, you know, whatever. Um, that's also going to be a huge resource loss, in particular for bees with much smaller bodies that don't have the ability to fly a very long distance. Um, monoculture cropping, kind of like I mentioned, you know, giant wheat fields are great for me because I love bread, but giant wheat fields might be honestly so big and vast that a bee can't fly across it to get to the flowering plants on the other side of it. And then of course, pollen and nectar could be potentially laced with pesticides, which be, the bees are being exposed to when they are able to find plants that are um, providing floral, resource, floral resources. Um, and then finally, this um, climate change has been shown to be causing temporal mismatch with certain host plants. So um, with increasing temperatures, plants are blooming and flowering earlier. But because many insects respond to a combination of temperature and day length, um, although they might be reaching that temperature threshold, they might not reach that day length threshold to emerge. And so for certain type of bees, particularly ones that um, require specialized diet, they emerge after their floral resource has already um, finished blooming. Hopefully this little critter looks very familiar to all of you. Um, this is our uh, European honeybee, um, Apis mellifera. You should hopefully all be familiar with the fact that they are colony nesters, can, um, can reside in colony numbers of around 40,000, but can certainly be much smaller or much bigger. 
Um, they are what we call a eusocial or truly social insect, which means they have um, a cooperative brood care. They divide labor um, according to different cast structures. Their generations overlap. Um, and then around 80% of commercial honeybee colonies are migratory. So the large beekeeping operations are moving their bees around the country to align and pollinate um, a lot of crops when they are coming into flower. Um, I sometimes get uh, a little bit of a side eye, but honeybees are also, in my opinion, the one of the most successful invasive species that we have in the United States. So other members of the Aphidae family, that same family as bumblebees or of honeybees, include bumblebees and carpenter bees, um, as well as um, a lot of solitary bees. This bee here shown is called a ceratina. It's a very small bee that's solitary um, and ground nesting, or sorry, cavity nesting. Um, so it typically lives in um, like hollow twigs. They're pretty tiny. They're maybe the size of like a grain of long grain rice. Um, they can be, the apidae can be anywhere from solitary to social, um, and they carry their pollen on their legs. The megachylids are the, um, the uh, leaf cutter bees. Um, so these bees are, um, you might also know them as blue orchard bees, wool carter bees, leaf cutter bees, mason bees, squash bees, and sunflower bees are all part of this family. Um, they are also cavity nesters, so they like to nest in holes. Um, you can usually encourage them to um, settle and, and make nests in your garden by providing those tube straws, which I um, definitely was seeing pretty regularly at the co-op, and then recently I started seeing them even at Costco. Um, so, you know, pretty cool um, that people are starting to pay a little bit more attention to the fact that there are more types of bees out there than just honeybees and bumblebees. Um, these bees typically are what we call gregarious or semi-social, um, where they, they, many different bees will build nests kind of a, in a similar area. The main reason for that isn't necessarily that they're actually working together, but just that they have found a location that is suitable for their nesting needs. Um, these bees carry the pollen on their underside of their abdomen. Um, I'm not sure, can you see my cursor? Thumbs up if you can see my cursor moving. Nope, okay. Um, well, hopefully then you all know what an abdomen is. <laughs> so um, on, you can see the abdomen on this bee has kind of this light yellow cream color, um, really dense hair, and that almost acts like Velcro for the pollen, and they'll kind of pack the pollen onto the underside of their abdomen there. Um, and that allows them to carry it without carrying it on their legs. Um, so if you ever notice a bee like in a squash flower or on a sunflower and they have that bright yellow underside, you're most likely looking at a megachylid. Um, and a characteristic of these bees is that they have huge mandibles um, and that is so that they can tear leaves off of plants and use them to line the insides of their nest. The wool carter bees, are, the, which is shown here, um, they will scrape the fuzz off of fuzzy plants like lamb's ear um, and use that to line and kind of weatherproof the inside of their nests. Um, I have also seen them use their huge mandibles to tear the wings off of other bees because they're extremely territorial and also a little bit brutal. Holictidae are also known as the sweat bees. These are ground nesting, soil dwelling bees, um, and they are also kind of in that gregarious or semi-social class where they um, will typically nest near other bees of the same type, mostly because the nesting substrate is suitable for them. Um, they carry their pollen on their legs. You can't see it on this one because the one shown here is a male. Um, they're small to medium size. They tend to be smaller than a honeybee. Um, I've seen very, very tiny ones, again, kind of in that like size of a grain of rice size range. Um, my mind was blown when I first found out about these because look how beautiful this is, this like bright, shiny, um, iridescent green bee. Um, this bee is very common in the Puget Sound region. Um, there are a few different types. 
the males typically have green shiny head and thorax and then yellow striped abdomen and the females are usually either green head and thorax with black abdomen or all green and they kind of range anywhere from this yellowish green to like a bluish greeny teal they're really beautiful and they really like hanging out on aster type flowers um, and they really like california poppies so next time you have like a nice open California poppy, just like hang out and sit by it for a little while and see if you see one of these like shiny bright green bees because they're just so cool looking. Oh, and they're also called sweat bees because they will land on you and lick the sweat off of you, off of your skin. So if you see a bee land on you, one of these little guys, um, don't swat them. They're not wasps. They're just looking for a little bit of like salt. Coletidae are masked bees. Um, they are a little bit less common. I've only ever found a few of them um, in Western Washington. Um, I would say it would probably be kind of difficult to notice one if you were just kind of hanging out in your garden. Um, but they're also ground nesters. They are solitary um, and they carry their pollen internally. So you won't ever see a pollen carrying device like the hair on the underside of the abdomen or on the legs or the corbiculae like the honeybees and bumblebees have because they actually eat the pollen and then regurgitate it um, when they get back to their nest, kind of like a bird. And then finally, we have the Andrenidae. Um, these are mining bees. They dig really elaborate tunnels. Um, they are very common in hard packed sandy soil. Think like baseball fields. Um, they're also solitary, but can be somewhat gregarious, again, due to um, ideal nesting habitats. And I have been seeing these bees out a lot lately, kind of now um, in my garden. It, I don't know if it's much warmer or different. I know it's a lot sunnier over here than it is over there um, in general, but um, this is these are the bees that I've been seeing a lot around my garden lately. Um, they carry their pollen on their legs and um, and they, they do the majority of their nesting and kind of visibility in the beginning of the season. I usually stop seeing them around July. Oh, I did have one more. Um, the Melitidae, these ones, I don't think I've ever collected a Melitidae in Western Washington. Um, but if you were to see one, um, you would probably find it on uh, something like sunflower or an aster. Um, they are solitary, they are ground nesting, and they carry pollen on their legs. And they're really fuzzy, they look like little trucks. Um, but like I said, they're, they're relatively uncommon, especially in Western Washington. Okay, so along with bees, there are a lot of other pollinating insects, flies, wasps, beetles, butterflies, moths, um, in the non-insect categories, hummingbirds, bats, birds, anything that touches a pollen structure, picks up pollen and then moves it to another, um, another reproductive structure in a plant can be considered a pollinator. Um, so when I go outside and I really wanna make sure that my squash plants are getting pollinated and I go out with a paintbrush and I move pollen from the male plants to the female plants, I am also a pollinator. Okay, so I just want to introduce this um, idea of floral visitation. Um, so honeybees are really well known for having strong floral constancy, which means that they, on any foraging visit, the forager will visit the same type of flower over and over and over. Um, and that, can, that makes honeybee pollination extremely efficient because they're not picking up pollen, say, from a tomato and depositing it, depositing it on a squash. Um, a tomato pollen grain would just kind of block up the pollen tube of a squash and inhibit pollination. Um, so honeybees are really good at that floral constancy, which is really nice. Um, these floral visitation networks can do a lot to show how what the types of relationships between pollinators and plants within any ecosystem. Um, and the, the first two years of my PhD, so 2015, 2016, kind of into a little bit into 2017, we're really focused on building floral visitation networks for um, both urban and rural farming spaces throughout the Puget Sound region. So the furthest south I went was down around like Rochester, south of Olympia. 
And then I went all the way up to like Mount Vernon, Bow, almost into Bellingham on both sides of the sound. Um, and I built, um, oops, oh, I see. Um, and I and I collected a lot of data about the different types of insects that were visiting different types of plants. Um, so what you can see here, we have these three different types of flowers and these three different types of pollinators. And each of these, um, each of these has kind of a dependent relationship on each other. So, you know, in this first box, we have this yellow four leaf flower or four petal flower and this little gray fly, and they are in a relationship exclusively with each other. Um, the same here in the middle, the pink tulipy looking flower and this bumblebee have a pretty exclusive relationship with each other. If the tulip were to disappear, then that bumblebee would no longer have a floral resource. And therefore we might lose that bumblebee altogether. So this, these types of floral visitation networks are really important in understanding how the ecosystem is functioning. Um, here's just a kind of a larger example. So we've got these same three types of flowers and we've got four different types of pollinators here. Um, the pictures on the bottom are just showing a few different um, pollinator and plant interactions. Um, and what you can see here is, um, for example, this yellow flower has three different pollinators visiting it. So if one of the pollinators were to disappear, the yellow flower would probably be doing okay. Um, the same thing goes for really all of the other flowers. They, all of the three flowers have some, um, have more than one pollinator visiting it. Um, however, this little green bee on the far right is the, has this sort of oblig, obligatory relationship with the blue flower on the right. Um, and if that blue flower were to disappear, I'm sorry, um, the, green, the green bee would lose its floral resource and, and potentially um, die off. So this is a very simplified version of the types of, of um, floral networks that I constructed during my PhD. Um, this is an example of all of the plant insect interactions that I observed over an entire season. So um, the black rectangles on the top show the different types of pollinators. The black rectangles on the bottom show the different types of flowering plants. And then the lines in between, whether they're a black line or kind of a gray bar, show the number of individual interactions that I witnessed between a specific pollinator and that plant. Um, the width of the bars shows you the abundance of um, visitations that I saw of any individual, either insect or plant. So you don't have to like read all of this, there's a lot going on. But the cool thing that you can see is this is kind of visualizing and showing what the ecosystem um, kind of looks like and how all of these different types of insects are interacting with all of these different types of plants. And one of the things you'll see here is that the group that's kind of the largest here are actually flies. Um, I The majority of the reason for that is that I separated all the different types of bees. The bees are contributing about 60% of the pollination visits here, but flies are contributing about 35%. So the way that I collected this information is I went out with a clipboard and my watch and this little one by one meter square. And I counted a bunch of different types of flowering plants. And then I spent hours um, staring at plants and watching to see what types of insects were visiting them over periods of time. What I found was that the more urban settings, things like community gardens, um, actually had more different types of flowering plants. And so we're able to facilitate a higher number of different pollinator interactions. Um, but in rural settings, there were more overall, just a total abundance of flowering plants. And so those areas were able to support an overall higher abundance of insects. So kind of two different sides, um, the rural areas were supporting a larger overall number, total population of insects. 
Um, but the urban spaces, places like community gardens, were supporting much more diverse populations. This is just an example of one of the urban um, spaces. This is in downtown Seattle. Um, and you can see that these spaces a lot of times are managed, you know, one family or one individual has just a small plot. They're trying to really maximize the number of different plants. And so um, there end up being just tons of variety in these spaces. Whereas this is an example here in Eastern Washington. This canola field stretches for as far as the eye can see. Um, and although it's a great resource for pollinating insects, um, and canola was kind of the um, study system that I worked in for the second half of my PhD, um, and it is in fact an excellent resource for pollinating insects, it's not going to serve nearly the same diversity of, um, of pollinator populations. So both of these landscapes kind of are a bit extreme. Um, the urban landscapes really provide a small amount of a lot of different types of resources over the season. Um, you know, having a lot of different types of flowering plants at different parts of the season will provide continuous floral resources available for your pollinators. Whereas the rural landscapes provide a ton of one or two different types of food, but generally just for like a short burst of time. Um, and so it is really important that if you are um, investing in one of these different types of spaces that you know a little bit about the types of pollinators that might be existing. Um, for example, if you know that you have a lot of those andredin mining bees that are really active early in the season, it, it's a really good idea to try to have some plants that you know will flower really early in the season so that they have a food source available to them. Here's just a nice picture of a butterfly. <laughs> um, you can see there are a bunch of different types of butterflies here. And I think this is on a lavender farm. Um, so, you know, having, having a, a bunch of different types of flowers is um, not only, you know, really nice for bees, but also will support alternative pollinators as well, things like butterflies. Um, and also they're just nice to look at and smell. Um, and so I think provides some human benefit as well. So if you want to support wild pollinators, um, I'm going to tell you about a few different ways to do that. So just like humans and pretty much every other living creature, um, bees, pollinators need food, shelter, and water to, in, in order to survive and thrive. So food resources, um, all of bees, I say this all asterisk, um, collect pollen and feed on protein during their juvenile stages while adult bees are drinking nectar for energy. That all has an asterisk, of course, because you'll remember the cuckoo bees that steal um, resources from other bees. Um, but all most <laughs> bees collect pollen. And then also male bees um, don't collect pollen or really do anything other than provide reproductive support. Um, other pollination, or sorry, other pollinating insects provide pollination less directly um, the majority of them are picking up pollen while drinking nectar. Some of them are picking up pollen to eat. Um, some of those pollinators are um, eating pollen, nectar, other insects, other plant material, and so are kind of contributing to pollination a little bit less directly. They're not necessarily collecting the pollen and, and moving it, um, but rather they're sort of collecting pollen as just like as they go about their day. So, oh, excuse me. Cat, automatic cat feeder. Um, so um, providing food resources, flowering plants, um, is kind of the first step in supporting wild pollinators. Um, some pollinators can feed on a really wide variety of different pollen and nectar resources. Your honeybees are one of those generalist groups. Um, bumblebees are also generally um, quite generalist. Um, however, there are some types of bees, for example, this oil collecting bee or certain types of sweat bees that really rely on a specific type of flower. Um, for example, the sweat bees um, really rely on dandelion pollen for one stage of development. Um, there's an amino acid present in dandelion pollen that they can't really get anywhere else, but is um, really critical for one type of sweat bee. Um, for their development. 
so providing habitat and nesting, we have those kind of three main areas or types of nesting groups, colony nesting, like our honeybees and bumblebees, um, ground nesting, um, around 70% of bee species around the world nest in the ground. Um, so, you know, providing, I know some folks are starting to get into this and I've, I've got a little space in my garden that I'm really pleased with. Um, basically just a bed of bare-ish soil um, or soil that you have maybe flowers growing in, but there's like lots of pa um, packed, hard packed soil kind of in between so that the bees can nest in there. Um, many bees, especially things like bumblebees, will dwell in the abandoned nests of other animals. So like old mouse nests. Um, I feel like it's really common to find bumblebee nests like under your shed in a hollowed out mouse nest or something like that. And then others nest in very small cavities like hollowed out twigs. Um, those, those can be in the form of, you know, a branch or something from a plant, like a, a shrubby plant or... Um, I have some, oh gosh, what were they? Oh, all of my alliums last year, they had kind of a stiff stem. Um, I didn't get around to deadheading them early enough, but once they dried out, I realized that they are a nice little hollow twig. Um, and I did actually find some bees living in those um, and building nests in them. So if you have flowers that kind of leave a dry, hollow twig-like cavity, um, even though they might not look like they belong on the cover of like Home and Garden magazine, they're a great resource for nesting for your bees. And then of course, water. So nectar is syrupy um, and without adequate water, bees might not be able to stay hydrated or even be able to pull nectar out of a flower. Um, especially colony nesting bees, they really do require water to maintain hive temperature. So providing water kind of in your garden um, I've got mine in like a shallow bird bath that's got some marbles in it so that the bees have something to stand on so they don't just fall in and drown. Um, that can be really helpful, although I suppose it doesn't ever rain over there, so you all don't need to worry too much about that. Um, or sorry, it rains all the time, so you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> I was trying to make a joke and it fully just didn't work. Um, okay. So make sure that when you're planting flowers and you're choosing flowers to grow in your garden, or even if you have just like a back, uh, like a, a balcony with like a single pot that you have access to, um, planting different types of flowers that are flowering so that there are something blooming across the entire sort of season um, from spring through autumn is excellent. And flowers varying in size, shape, color, and bloom time will really support a nice diverse array of pollinators. You can provide nesting material. You can plant these flowers like you see in the top right here, those little lamb's ears that the um, wool carter bees can scrape. Um, you can provide these mason bee boxes. Of course, you're already providing colonies um, and, and boxes for your honeybees. Um, anything that you can do, um, leaving bare patches of undisturbed soil um, can be really helpful for your ground nesting bees. For some folks, that just looks like not digging up like your walking path. Um, the bees don't really mind it if you step on their nest but using a tiller or a fork or whatever to really like disrupt the soil structure, that can be more of a problem for them. And then of course, providing some shallow areas of water around your garden in like dishes, making sure that they have a place where they can land and drink from, um, shady areas where dew and sprinkler water might evaporate a little bit less quickly will also provide some extra water for your bees. And then if you are growing crops, um, providing habitat kind of refuge area for pollinators near your fields will not only um, provide them with some long-term habitat, but it will also encourage them to move into your crops and provide um, the kind of food resources that they need to support future generations of pollinators. Um, I know a lot of folks um, and I worked with some folks over at the Washington State Department of Transportation several years ago. Um, we're building pollinator buffers on the sides of like busy roads 
um, which kind of encourages the bees to fly up and over the roads so they're not getting hit by cars so much by having kind of shrubby bushes on the sides um, that have lots of flowers and things available to the bees. Um, it kind of acts as like a twofold where it's providing habitat and floral resources and it's also encouraging them to fly up and over the road so they're not getting hit by cars so much. Promoting pollinators is extremely economical. Um, if you are a landowner, land manager, farmer type person, um, there are a lot of programs that um, encourage growers to provide pollinator habitat. Um, the EQIP program can pay for a portion of installing pollinator habitat. The CRP program will pay for um, a subsidy uh, for setting aside some land for conservation, um, including pollinator habitat. Um, and many of the resources that are needed by pollinators can also be used by other beneficial insects, which can help reduce um, pest problems and increase crop yield while using less pesticides. Okay, so um, just for the last minute, a couple minutes or so, I'll just mention some of the current research um, that I'm working on. Um, our lab is working on a project with a few different industry partners to create tools for beekeepers to evaluate and monitor colony health. Um, one of the things that I notice kind of as um, more of a pollinator ecologist coming into this beekeeping world relatively recently, one of the things that I realized is um, there, there isn't really a lot of excellent tools um, and I think that it was kind of addressed in the questioning here is, you know, every question has an it depends. And that's great. And that's how life works. Um, but for somebody who might be a brand new beekeeper, it might be really helpful to kind of have a tool where you can input some information about your colony and get some information back. So I'm working to develop these tools um, and collecting data on about 15,000 honeybee colonies to support the development of this tool. Um, we've also heard a lot from mostly commercial beekeepers that they experience a lot of colony health reduction after pollinating blueberries, um, and we're not really sure why. And so we're working with them to um, monitor the um, bees' kind of progress all throughout the season, trying to understand if there's a pesticide exposure, um, if there's something to do with the pollen or nectar, in blueberry crops or a lack of additional foraging material when they're in that blueberry um, field. And then we're continuing to monitor them after blueberry pollination to see how they improve when they end up in a different crop um, to try to understand more about, um, about some of the colony health declines that we're seeing after that blueberry. Um, and then we're also working alongside our industry partners in bigger commercial beekeeping um, to try to develop some targeted tools and support decision aid systems um, for the majority for beekeepers that are moving their beehives um, in, mar in migratory beekeeping operations um, so that they can kind of look at a map and um, using some environmental and um, crop planning and, and geographical information can have an idea about whether or not a specific location will be a good spot for their bees to be placed at any given time of the year, um, because we'll be collecting a lot of different information about the types of crops and the types of flowers that might be available at any given point, dependent on environmental conditions like weather. All right, that is all I have. Thank you again so much for inviting me. Um, and if you all have questions, I will happily take them. Thanks so much, Ray. That was really awesome. Um, that was really a nice presentation. Um, I, I see a couple of questions here in the chat. Um, and I don't know if you want to mute yourself. Actually, that might make it nicer. Um, Jerry was the first question that came in the chat. I was just curious what sort of health issues you see in bees after pollinating blueberries. Yeah, that's a great question. So we've had a few different issues that have come up. Um, one of them is we see some brood issues that almost look like foul brood, but 
aren't fell brood, but we get these kind of like ropey, snotty brood um, that, you know, we've, we've tested it and it's not fell brood, but we're not really sure what it is. Um, we also just generally see a real lack in um, population increase. They kind of just stall out a little bit. Um, and then even once they've been put onto new crops, they don't really kind of like pick back up very well. They just, they just kind of suck. <laughs> like they just like they just seem like they don't perform very well. They're not producing very much honey. They're really reduced in their brood production. Um, and it's really interesting because um, blueberry pollen is not good for honeybees. They really don't prefer it. Um, honeybees aren't great at pollinating blueberry, and they're not really very good at collecting that blueberry pollen. Um, bumblebees are much more well equipped to collect that pollen um, because they can vibrate the pollen out of the flower much more easily. Um, but um, some folks at Oregon State University did a few studies and they found that even when blueberries are placed in, or sorry, when honeybees are placed in blueberry yards, only about 2% of the pollen that they're bringing back to the hive is blueberry um, because they just don't really like it very much. And so we're trying to understand a little bit better about what else they might be bringing back into the hive um, and what else they might be being exposed to when they're out collecting other things because, you know, they're placed in the blueberry yard. So we have access to pesticide and spray records from the blueberry grower, but not necessarily what else is kind of going on around them. And so we're trying to learn a little bit more about what the bees might be exposed to and, and what other kind of difficulties they might be dealing with um, during that blueberry pollination period. Thank you. That's very interesting. I hope you guys find what what's going on. Um, right, me too. Because <laughs> <laughs> that really sucks. Yeah, it's a bummer. <laughs> uh, Anne, did you want to unmute yourself? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, um, I, what I didn't know that they sprayed blueberries. <laughs> ah! Anyway, I'm just wondering if the industries could just like cut down a little on the pesticides. Is there any other way? Is there any other strategy besides putting poison on the plants that we could come up with? I'm sure we could come up with something else that's more healthy for everyone. I, I, I honestly, I agree with you. And that's really the main reason why I got interested in this work. Um, we're hoping that the tool, the kind of decision aid support tool will illuminate um, some of the, and, and also some of the pesticide tracking, um, the residue tracking that we're monitoring will illuminate where bees are being exposed. We're going to be taking this data like every single month and every single time they move to a new crop. And so we're hoping to learn more about where they're being exposed to different types of pesticides. Um, and hopefully we can use that to direct maybe some policy changes. Um, but yeah, blueberries have, uh, especially in Western Washington, because it's so wet over there, um, fungicides are one of the biggest um, applied pesticides to blueberries um, in that area. So. As much as I'm generally a proponent of eating locally or regionally, if you can get blueberries that are grown in eastern Washington, they apply far fewer fungicides because <laughs> it's not so wet over here. It's, it's actually funny where we intersect. I, I'm actually a lawyer by training, and oh. I studied the whole modern way that we produce food uh, mm -hmm. from an intellectual property standpoint. And actually, this is a very complex ecosystem, and to kind of add to that question is yeah. a lot of farmers don't have a choice in how they really grow plants because no, they don't. in a different way requires a different system completely which is super expensive um and so that's when they have the option and sometimes they don't have the option because actually believe it or not a bean that you plant might have somebody with a patent on it and you're yep. not allowed to do what you want with the bean um, so <laughs> just yeah. adding that up there, it's, it's, it's another uh, layer of complexity where we intersected actually from two very different standpoints. Yeah, but that's actually very, I might have to follow up with you because we've been having a lot of legal questions coming our way specifically regarding like pollinators and patented material. So happy to, to 
<laughs> yeah, I, I think you have access to my email. If you wouldn't mind just like shooting me an email so I have your contact information, that'd be great. <laughs> Absolutely, will do. Uh, and I think next, so we had some, uh, uh, Robin had a question and then Gary in the chat. I, okay, so Robin's question, I have honeybees as well as wild bee habitats. Can the wild bees compete with forage for honeybees? That is a great question. Um, so the wild bees definitely sometimes have a hard time competing with honeybees. Um, as I mentioned kind of early on, um, and people don't always like it, especially honeybee people don't always love it when I say that honeybees are the, the world's best invasive species. Um, they can outcompete some of the wild pollinators. Um, but I will say, you know, unless you have like a dozen honeybee colonies in your like small backyard. Um, I think it's it's probably going to be fine. I've got honeybees and wild bee habitats, and I really don't have too much problem. It seems like the wild bees will um, sort of shift, or they'll. I've noticed sometimes they'll stay out a little bit later than the honeybees do, or they'll like wake up a little bit earlier than the honeybees do, and kind of get some of their resources met before the honeybees come out in full force. Gary has a Mason B question. Gary, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, hi. hi. Um, yeah, so super glad you brought up uh, Mason bees and just all the different pollinators. Um, so we we have a Mason bee house, just that, you know, store bought mm -hmm. and it's, it's got sort of uh, bamboo tubes in there. Yep. And um, firstly, I was wondering, um, so some of them, they're still capped and they haven't mm -hmm. come out. Is that that's pretty normal for this time of year. Okay. Yep. And yeah. the other a lot of the mason bees don't start coming out until it gets quite a bit warmer. Okay. Okay. That's good. And then the other thing I was wondering about is um, I saw some of them with sm like very small holes and I expected the new ones might be bigger. And I was wondering just in general, what I might look out for, for like, because I know they can get attacked by parasitic flies. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a neighbor awesome. who carefully pulls them out and refrigerates them and cleans them to make sure they're safe. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering what I might look for to know if I have any parasites that have taken over. That one's a really tough one. Um, the okay. parasitic, I know the parasitic wasps in particular can, mm -hmm. they make just the tiniest little hole and they insert their ovipositor into this tiny hole and you really wouldn't know that a wasp has, um, has parasitized your bees until, unless you set up like a camera and you watched who emerged. Um, so that part is kind of a bummer. Um, okay. But in terms of, um, you know, there's not really much you can do about it. Um, I, I think I might start with paper tubes like my neighbor and just mm -hmm. set something up that I can like go. It's the fall. They're all asleep and clean them and then just fridge them mm -hmm. or put them in the garage. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Rita has a BID question. I will do my best. <laughs> Thank you. I know I'm hoping this won't be too much of a, a difficult one, but I saw I had a, a bee in my backyard. Um, it was it seemed to really like the salmon berry in my backyard that was was flowering uh, like earlier on in the month. And it was super fuzzy, like a bumblebee and with really fuzzy legs, but it flew around like kind of zipped around instead of flying like lazily like a normal bumblebee. And so I was wondering if you have any ideas what that might be, because I've been driving myself nuts trying to figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, do you remember color pattern or size? I mean, oh gosh, like it was it was on the bigger side, you know, like much bigger than a honey bee. Maybe mm -hmm. not quite as big as some of like the um I think what is it the the some of the larger like bumblebees. So it was kind of in the middle, yeah, larger than honey bee, you know. Um mm -hmm. and oh gosh, I, 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 have, I have photos of it, but it's, you know, it was kind of a I want to say it was like an had like a yellow stripe on its butt or something, you know, it's just kind of, yeah, black it, and yellow. <laughs> yeah, it could have been a honey or a bumblebee, um, especially some of the early season bumblebees. And over there, um, you've got the Sitka bumblebee and, uh, oh gosh, I'm going to blank on all the bumblebee names. There's like nine different types of bumblebees in Western Washington. Um, it just, I, the, 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 pa the flight pattern was kind of the most interesting thing to me. And that's why I thought yeah. like, you know, it, and I don't, I was doing so much research trying to figure it out and nobody ever seemed to mention like the way that it, they fly, you know? Yeah, so actually, like, I have a really cool yeah. resource that I'll drop into the chat. Um, 
but uh, you, there are bumblebee bumblebee queens um, can fly pretty quickly, and they will. They, basically, so bumblebee queens are the only members of their um, colony that over that that survives through the winter. And so they're the first ones in the springtime that come out. I do because they're larger and they can produce a little bit of their own warmth. They're out much earlier. Mm. Um, and so I do actually see them um, much earlier than anything else. And because basically they... Um, because they're the only ones in their colony that are doing work, they have a lot to get done. <laughs> and so they do really kind of move with a much more purpose than other bumblebees. Um, I just dropped a research link. This was a publication that a colleague and I put together, a few colleagues and I put together on a re reference guide to wild bees and floral visitors in Western Washington. Um, it could also, um, I think Dee Marie said, wool carter bee, that was going to be my next guess. Um, they tend to also move very quickly and like in lots of really straight lines. Um, mm -hmm. The um, and the males in particular are quite big. Um, I'm trying to think. I'm, I don't necessarily know. They're they're kind of a generalist. Like they would certainly visit Salmonberry. I don't see any reason why they wouldn't. Um, the wool carter bees, they do kind of a weird, almost hover. Um, and then they'll like zip. Yeah, that was kind and of, that was one thing that I noticed was like the hovering and the zipping that was just so interesting to me. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for the, yeah. the resource too. It's very funny. I, I just want to say really quick, and I hope this is true for other people as well, you know, that like in getting into honeybees, you know, I have started paying attention to like so many other different kinds of pollinators and like what's visiting. And like I said, I'm totally nerding out by like trying to take photos now and look at the patterns on bees so I can like identify them, you know, it's just like opened up a whole new world for me. So it's really oh, yeah. but, It's amazing. Yeah. And I love that you get to experience that because there are so many cool bees over there. You, you <laughs> all in Western Washington have way more bees than we do in Eastern Washington. I don't know if the red-tailed bumblebee is in this area, though. I think that's more of a mis Midwestern, um, just following up on the chat. Um, but there are a couple of other ones. There's like the, oh gosh, red-belted bumblebee um, that I've seen over there. And there's another one, Bombus centralis and Bombus rufosinctus. I'm blanking on the common names, but um, I think Bombus rufosinctus is like the red-belted bumblebee. Um, and I think... There is one, the Sitkensis, that has like an orange kind of back end of their abdomen. Any other questions? Oh, Kit's got a question. You're muted, Kit. Too many buttons. Um, <laughs> so I wonder when you have one of those stalks from a plant that has gone to seed would you leave it standing or does it matter would you leave it standing in the garden or would you lay it down for them to be able to crawl into it i left them standing and i found them nesting um and they seemed just fine um you could kind of bundle them together if you wanted to like clean up your garden and make it look a little bit nicer you totally could just like snip them at the bottom and kind of bundle them together the same way that you might see like a mason bee house um, and just kind of stick it in an area of your garden. Um, but yeah, I just was lazy and left them and, <laughs> and they did just fine. That's great. I love messy gardens now. Oh yeah, me too. I actually have a question following up on this. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in my yard, I, I have, you know, mason bees. I've caught bubble bubble bee nests that I rescue when people have them in their hedges and things mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and honeybees and uh, the mason bees I've been trying to get them to nest in my dead flower stalks I mm -hmm. collect them I make nice little bundles I try to put them right next to uh, the bamboo ones and somehow they do not like anything else on the bamboo ones and I'm stuck because I don't have bamboo in my yard so I can't replace the tubes um, and I'm wondering if any anybody has experienced that and if there's an explanation of what I might be doing wrong because the diameter is about right. 
it's just the texture is different and somehow they don't like it as much. It might, yeah, I mean, it might be that they don't like the texture because it doesn't feel quite as sturdy. Um, you'd also be amazed at how tiny of a difference the diameter needs to be for them to decide they're not interested. Um, it's like, you know, fractions of a millimeter for them to be like, no, this is not what I want. <laughs> so even though to us, it's like, oh, this is less than one millimeter difference in size. The bee is like, mm -mm, no, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions come in the chat. I don't know if anybody has questions, wants to unmute yourself. Huh. Seems like things are slowing down and um, I just everything your your pictures were wonderful. Your uh, your presentation style is really easy and comfortable and excellent. I, I just really enjoyed your presentation. I, I'm sure others did. We had lots of people on with you. Um, so I really um, I can't say enough of gratitude. Um, and I love the idea that you're motivated to help change the pattern of uh, farming, if you will, because I, I think that that's the thing that is behind so much. And it's, it's such a big, big, big process to shift that the more effort we have from people like you, um, it's really wonderful to know that you, you're attracted to that. Thank feel you, like you yeah. can make a difference. I'm sure trying. <laughs> I just got a grant to support my research for the next three years. And a huge component of that research is going to be working toward tools for beekeepers that provide kind of collecting data that provide research or like provide tools to beekeepers that then kind of collect data back to us that we hope to encourage um, and we're gonna be supporting a student um, intern who's really interested in science policy um, to try to influence policy changes and decisions because um, because there are so many problems and everybody is getting kind of screwed. You know, the bees are experiencing huge health problems. The beekeepers are experiencing economic problems. The farmers are experiencing pollination problems. And it's all this really nasty cycle. And I think, and the, you know, the population is experiencing health problems. Exactly. I mean, yeah, there's just so many different facets of it. And, you know, I'm 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 very invested in a strong, healthy human population. And that really comes down to like so many other levels. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. This was really great. I would love to come to more of your virtual meetings. <laughs> well, um, you don't Please have to be a to member to come to these meetings. <laughs> and um, I can, let's see, how would I, I could just add you to the email list and you. send you send you what's going on with our, <laughs> with our yeah, make, give you an honorary membership. That yeah. ought to be available, right? That's great. <laughs> yeah. I would love that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, okay, I, I guess to we try with, to join with, the local beekeeping association, but I'm not sure they're quite so active as you all. We, um, I have just learned that Puget Sound Beekeepers is by far the largest organization in Washington State. And there's a lot of us. Um, when you look on a map and on the Washington um, Beekeepers Association, um, Washington State. Uh, Beekeepers Association website. It, it charts us all out. There's several lots, you know, but yeah. some some of them, you know, 50 is a big membership. So um, mm -hmm. that's not our case. We're between three and 400. So yeah, that's it's, amazing. It's a good group. Well, it's a big yeah. place. And so that's why having feedback from members is so terrific. So I hope I see me and me and Mogli, we're going to have to re research. Uh, we research ourselves. Um, anyway, thank you. Appreciate very much all your efforts and contribution. Yeah, thank you so much. Good luck with your three-year project. That sounds fabulous. I bet thank you have you. a party after you got that grant. Oh yeah, a party that day and then like a complete panic attack the next day because <laughs> I was like, oh, I wrote this huge project and now I have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> reality yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no it's really great 
That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, right, thank you, care. everybody. Um, we'll see a lot of you in person and look for more information about that. Um, hopefully we can, um, yeah, become hybrid, I think. Okay. Thank you very much. Good yeah. evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.